I've got a little thought that I got this several months ago, and uh, I hope it'll do for you what it did for me. Uh, out of Second Samuel chapter 15, uh, and we'll read one verse. That's what Brother Doug said to do, and he's. Uh, I want to try to be obedient. In verse number 29, and you know, like the brother said this morning, this Bible is all about Jesus. Yeah. It's all about him, front to back. In verse 29, it says, Zadok, therefore, and Abathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And you know, my first point is this, that this ark represents the presence of God. And I want you to just kind of, maybe in your mind, see these two guys walking to Jerusalem and they're carrying this box. Yeah. And with that thought in mind, I want to preach on what's in the box. Yeah. Yeah. And you, could you imagine, I think this, there would be no greater privilege than for someone to say, he's got God on him. Yeah. And that's what you see when you see these two fellows with this box. They've got God on them. What our church needs, we don't need fancier churches. We don't need fancier pews. We don't need fancier clothes. We don't need fancier cars. What we need is the presence of God because it's His presence that causes things to happen. Why was there 39 people saved at Brothers Orange? Because of the presence of God. It wasn't because of the nice pews. It wasn't because of the nice cars. It was because God was stirring and moving. What we need in our life this week is to, for God to get on top of us and to breathe through us and allow us to do what God wants us to do. God has something for us. You know, the world looks at this. There ain't nothing happening here. But this place right here is changing lives. Why? Because there's a presence of the Holy Spirit. We need God on us. Our young people, you need God on you. you don't worry about your education. That ain't the answers to life. Because huh? I don't care how well educated you are. It ain't going to matter when this is over. What's in this box? Well, second thing, you had to be a priest to pack it. And in Revelation 1 said he's made us kings and priests. You know who? The world can't pack this box. Uh, backsliders can't pack this box. But the priests of God can pack this box. They can have God. You, you, I've heard people say, well, everybody can't have the presence of God on them. That's a lie. God wants you to have all of Him. Not part of Him, not some of Him, not a little bit of Him. He wants to have you, and He wants you to have Him. But if you're a priest, you can do that. That's what's in this box tonight. Uh, another thing that's in this box is a privilege. The world don't have that privilege. Uh, they have all the stuff, fortune, fame you'll never see us on channel 5 news right. you know why ain't important but we will see us up in heaven yeah. and Jesus looking down and he is saying I'm proud of them folks down there yeah. because they came to church you know what a lot of people did they stayed home tonight brother Ray yeah. you know why they stayed home they wanted to yeah. they didn't come not just to this church, but all across this world, people aren't coming back. Why? Because they don't want to. But there's a great privilege that you and I have to be faithful to God. You may never be a great preacher. You may never be a great singer. But one thing you can be is a child of God. You can be faithful. You can be faithful to come and sit in your spot. You can be faithful to say thank you, God, for what you've done for me, for being good to me and saving me by your grace. You can be faithful. That's a privilege the world don't have. Uh, what's in this box? There's power in this box. Uh, if you study this out, they put cherubims and the mercy seat was on this box uh, and God told Moses I'll meet with you there that's what we need 
we need God's power. Huh? I don't care what you do. Only religion will empower you to do religious things. Religion is emotions. And there is a fine line between spiritual things and emotional things. We are emotional people. But what we need is God's power to move in us and let us do a spiritual work. The devil's been working at my house for 44 years. <laughs> but he's really been working this week. Hmm? That's all right. I, I thought about, you know, I, I, one of the problems I had, I, or my wife and I had, I, I, I thought, well, I'll just quit fighting. And then I just got mad and said, no, I, I want to fight now. I'm going to fight now. Why? Because I like it. I'm going to fight for my family. My family may not mean nothing to the world, but they mean something to me. Hey, they go to hell. They'll go to hell with me telling them there's a way out. Hey, man. Why? Because in that box is power. There's power that changed my life. Uh, you know, you, you didn't do a lot of drugs or alcohol, but you was as lost as Barry Spears when he gave his testimony. Yeah. You was just as lost. Right. Religious sitting right in the church. Right. You know what? You'd have went to hell just like Barry would have went, just like I would have went. Yeah. Uh, there's power that changed your life. Sure. You know what? You'd have been the best salesman on your way to hell. Sure. But right. because of God who transformed your life, yeah. there's power. I don't understand this, Brother Ray. I do not understand how God can take a wicked sinner and change his life and put him in a church, let him testify, let him sing, let him preach, do what I... That blows my mind. Huh? That's just the power of God. Huh? How... How... I was thinking about the Saul on the way here. I thought when he got saved... His whole life, he gave up everything. Huh? When he became Paul the Apostle, he walked away from all of his wealth. He walked away from all of his, all the, all the riots that he, rights that he had to the, uh, all of his religious stuff. I want to tell you something. It takes power to do that. There's only a, one, a God in heaven that can change your life. I remember as an 18 year old boy getting saved that night. I didn't want, I wanted to, but I didn't want to. You know why? Because the devil had he told me, you won't have no friends. Huh? I didn't have any anyway. Really, they weren't my friends. There's a difference between being an associate and being a friend. Huh? I didn't have no true friends. And you'll find out you don't have no true friends because the world don't know what it is to be a friend. But this thing that's in this box, it can transform your life. He can take alcohol out of your breath. He can take drugs out of your arms. He can take lust out of your mind. It's a, it's a, it can take every kind of disease. I don't care if you suffer. What kind of disease you suffer from? Mentally or if you're depressed, discouraged, down and out. You, the Bible says greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. I'm telling you, if you want out, you can get out. Why? Because what's in this box is powerful. It's powerful. But it's personal. These two packed it, the other two didn't. The other ones didn't. Right. Right. Huh? Right. You want the box? You want in this box? Yeah. It's, your, it's your decision. Yeah. Huh? It's left up to you. Right. You can have all of God or you can have none of Him. Right. You can have all of God or you can have part of Him. You can have Him on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But you don't have to have Him on my Monday, Tuesday, and all the other days. You don't have to but I advise you to. Yeah. Why? Because that will change your life. Right. It, there is a purpose. And I know sometimes it gets you thinking, this really, we're not doing anything. But lives are being changed. Yeah. Yeah. If just praying for them, if that's all you can do is pray for them, but in that box will transform their life. Yeah. Huh? Last of all, what was in that box showed Everybody else, what part of the family they were in. Huh? Had to be a Levite. Huh? They said, oh, those are Levites. They're packing that box. Huh? You know what? When you get out of the morning and you put your Bible under your, hand, under your arm, you know what that says? He's different. 
She's different. There's something different about that for them people. Huh? So, so what's different about it? He said, he got a Bible in his hand. He's going somewhere. She's got a nice dress on. Got a nice suit on. Now that don't mean you're saved. But you tuck this Bible under your arm. It's a lot of proof that you might be. Huh? I want to tell you something. Packing this box around will prove to people who you are. Huh? It will prove to people. They'll look. They'll say, "Them some strange. There's, those are some weirdos." I want to be a weirdo for Jesus. I really do. I want God's power in my life. I want God. Not for me. I just want to be so close to Him that people say, "This guy right here, he's he's different than everybody else. He's not just your mundane." Well, I believe Jesus. There's a difference between saying it and really believing it. What's in the box? Do you want what's in the box today? I do. We need to get what's in the box. I need it more than I have realized, Brother Brian. This revival is going to make us or break me. I need it because my personal life, I've been beat down by circumstances in my life. And I need God's presence to show up in my house and in my car and in my life. God bless. Turn to Genesis 45. I'm going to go through a background setting first. Joseph, second in command. We're into the... Uh, the drought season now. It's two years into the drought. How did it get to this point? Because of a dream that Pharaoh had. The title of the message is How to Fix a Broken Relationship. Jesus is the main character. He's always the main character. In verse 42, I'm going to, I'll, I'll probably have to use, you said between seven and ten minutes, okay? I'm going to have to use every bit of it probably. Um, Joseph was in charge. He's second in command. He's the governor. What's happening here is in order to get food, you got to go to him. You got to go to Joseph. That's the background. So one day, Israel, which is Jacob, said, We're running low. We, get, we need some food. He sent his boys down to Egypt. Go get the food. He, they're, they, they're coming. They're, there they are. Who do you think sees them first? Joseph does. And you know that had an effect on him. It's been Joseph. I'm, I'm speculating Joseph could be in his fifties. No, they hadn't seen Joseph. hadn't seen his brothers in since he was 17 years old. I believe that's when it was. And it had a lot of effect on him. As my brothers, and he, I, I, I honestly think he started crying. Then there's times you're going to get emotional. You will get emotional if you serve the Lord. And there's going to be a time when you're going to be tested and you're going to cry and you're going to cry. Why don't they get it? What happened? Here, I'll tell you why. Joseph seen his brothers at least three times and he has seen a change in them because you're going to be tested. Joseph was testing them. Jesus is going to test us. How tough are you? He wants to see if your demeanor's changed. I'm going somewhere, but just hold on. I'm going somewhere with this. Joseph received more than adequate proof that his brothers had changed. Their character has changed. They, not, they aren't the way they used to be back when they were younger. And that's what happens. They get older. God's working on them. God's working on that heart. Now, Joseph is wanting that relationship back. When he sees his brothers, there's going to come a time. There's going to come a time when you're going to bust out crying. Now, in verse, in verse 1, then Joseph could not reframe himself anymore before them. He stood by them and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. 
And there he stood no more with me while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Now, here's what's happening. Joseph told everyone to get out. Get out! All, the he, all those individuals that were helpers, now his brothers are in there. His brothers are thinking, what's going on here? Don't you know who I am? He says this, and he's wept aloud. He cried, don't you know who I am? They ain't got a clue. It's a picture of Christ. Don't you know who I am? Jesus Christ is button fellowship. It's a picture of Christ. When we pass out tracts every Monday night, or when we witness, like Brother Ron said, we put that Bible underneath our arm. We're telling people we represent Jesus. Don't you want to know about me? Don't you want to know about me? Joseph is brokenhearted when he sees his brothers. He wants to fix it. And after all he done to them, after all they done to Joseph, he's still wanting to fix him. A broken relationship. This is Jesus. Jesus is all in this. He couldn't contain his emotions. In verse 3, and Joseph said unto his brothers, I am Joseph. Who is the I am? It's Jesus. He says it again. I am. This brethren could not answer. How do you respond to that? We haven't seen you in years. How do you respond to that? When Jesus is sending conviction upon you, how do you respond to that? I remember when I was fell under conviction. You don't know what to do. You don't. But all I know is I was white knuckling at that pew but from behind me when I was at the Florence First Church of God. What do you do? And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near. Now when they were speechless, in verse 4, it says, Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me. I pray you that you come near. And he said, I am. He says it again. Joseph said, I'm your brother whom you sold me into Egypt. Don't you remember me now? But Jesus in his, I'm sorry, but Joseph in his, the way he, he, he pre represents himself has a way of saying it just like Jesus. He says, in verse 5, he says right here, Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither, for God has sent me before you to preserve life. That's a picture of Christ. That I've never seen a picture. When Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just come unto me. That's why, that's why he approaches his brother. I know what you've done to me, but it was for a good reason, to preserve life. That's what Jesus does. He preserved my life. If you're a born-again Christian, he's preserved your life. We're no different. He's preserved your life. The unexpected words. They weren't anticipating that that day. But there had been a change in these people. And that's what Jesus does. He'll change you from inside out. The things I want to do, I tell those people into jails, the things, and I've heard it preached here, the things I want to do before I did do, I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to do that. Every day you've got to live, eat, and breathe Jesus Christ. He don't want a quarter of your life. He don't want half. He don't want three quarters. He wants every bit of you. He wants it all. Because he doesn't say in here, I saved half your life. Now go ahead and do the other half. I don't care. He wants all your life. He wants all your... He wants everything about you. And that's what Joseph wants. This is a picture of Christ. He wants that fellowship. He wants that fellowship. And that's what Jesus wants. He wants fellowship. We see that in verse... Verse 
But Jesus, I'm going to go to verse 28 of this chapter. Jesus, want, uh, Joseph wanted to see his father. And Israel said, it is enough. After the confirmation from his brothers, when they told Israel or Jacob what had happened, what had transpired, he said, and Israel said, it is enough that Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, the whole concept of this is that was his hope. He's seen his son once again, and that's our hope. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 and 3, we shall see him, every man that hath this hope in him, purify himself. Now, I cut a lot out due to time constraints, but I want to mind my pastor. But the Lord laid this on my heart and how this is a picture of Christ, every bit of it. And in verse 11, it says it right here, and there I will nour nourish thee, for thee are yet five years of famine left, and thou and thy household, and all that thou hast come to poverty. That's a picture of Christ, and that's what this is. Jesus Christ loves every one of us. And Jesus is my everything. It, um, I, when you read this stuff, it's just, it touches your heart. And believe me, my word etiquette, my, I don't, I'm not the best speaker there is. But I know when Jesus shows up in my Bible, he's my everything. Bless the Lord. We're going to be in Job 4, verses 17 through 19. And the Bible says, Shall mortal man be more, than, more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and he charged his angels. He charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. Now I want to give a little bit of a background here. The uh, Job's friend, Eliphaz, he was talking to Job. And he said, you've given much help. You've strengthened the hands of many around here. You've showed them and you've led them in the way. But now that trouble has come upon you, you can't handle it. The words you speak, they helped others. But now that trouble's come to you, you fell through. You hit rock bottom. Just because you help someone doesn't mean you can do it yourself. As Brother Cody Zorn said in our revival, the spirit of self-righteousness. That's what he had. That's, that's what he fell through with. We don't see that until Job 31. But... He said, you've done many things to help people, but you can't do it yourself. Yeah. Job was relying on himself. In verse 17, we see the mortality manifest. It said, shall a mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? That reveals to us the humility and lowly estate of man. Right. In verse 18, we see the mistrust of the many. It said, behold, he put no trust in his servants, and he charges his angels with folly. He said, even the beings higher than us, us lowly man, he charged with folly. They aren't even worthy. In verse 19, it says, How much less than them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. In verse 19, we see the much is measured. How much less in them? How much less in common man than those angels? So what I want to preach on for a couple minutes is how much. How much longer will we stay lukewarm? How much longer will we tolerate sin in our life? How much longer will we stay away from sinners? How much longer and how much more will we take, from, take for ourselves and not give to others? How much longer will we not work out our own salvation? How much longer will we sleep while God is staying? Whether He be staying with us or staying judgment from us. How much, long, how much more spite will we take from the world? How much longer will we have a prideful and arrogant attitude in our lives? How much more sin do you think God will tolerate from you? How much more? 
How much? This morning, we had a great sermon of praise unto the Lord. We gave much to the Lord this morning, but that's not going to satisfy for this week. How much will you give of yourself? As Brother Ron said, he doesn't want half. He doesn't want half. He didn't give you three quarters. He gave everything, so you ought to give him everything back. God didn't save half of you. He saved all of you. But our mind isn't saved. Our body isn't saved. Our soul is saved. But if we don't control our body, our mind can go out of control. How much will you let the devil speak for you? A couple of months ago, the temptations that the devil was throwing in my life were great. And then it, it occurred to me that I knew the devil's voice better than the Lord's. Every time temptation would come up, I'm like, no, devil, I can't do that. And then I'd try and search for the Lord's voice, and I couldn't find it. I knew the devil's voice better than my own master. How much longer do you think we have to live for the Lord? How much longer? We may, we may not even have the next five minutes. It's the simple fact. We may not have it, but we don't believe it. We go to bed. We, we, hear, we hear sermons. We go to bed. Wake up the next morning. And we think, well, we're here. There must be tomorrow. There must be something. How much longer? How much? How much, how, how much longer do we have to tell our families? How many people in here have a lost family member? Everyone. Amen. Every single person in this church has a lost family member. Sure. Are you trying? How much are you trying? <clears throat> if you have something you need to get right or something you need to tell someone, how much longer will you wait? Amen. How much longer do you think the father will tell the son not to go get his bride? Yeah. Mercy. Mercy. We may not have the next five seconds. Right. But we don't believe that. We need to get it through our thick skulls, our hardened hearts, that we can't take this any longer. How much more will we take? How much? How much longer will we sit here and do nothing? How much time do we have left? How much will you do for the Lord? The Bible says, They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Amen. But what are you going to do with it? How much mercy has He given to you? How much love has He given to you? I'll tell you this, it's more infinite than the universe. Yeah. He's bestowed on us great things which we know not. Amen. It's His grace in our lungs and His strength in our backs tonight. Yeah. Lord's coming back. Amen. How much time till He comes? How much will you do? How much will you serve? How much will you keep yourself for Christ? Amen. We came back filled from camp. But that won't mean anything if we don't give our all. Right. How much? If I were you today, I would get my mind made up yeah. that nothing is going to stop me from living out right. my days as a servant for Christ that will aid others. Loving and serving the Lord with all that is within you. We need some people that will stand up and say, I will. There will be no question about it. There is no question who will serve the Lord because I will. There is no question to who will love others. I will. There is no question to who will be sold out for God because I will. In my house, there is... I will. Joshua said... Choose you whom this day you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sounds like he had an I will attitude. He said, I will. I will. Will you? How much will you give? How much will you take? Will you serve the master? Because I long to be more like the master. More humility from the Lord. We see the lowly estate in verse 19. He said, How much less in them that dwell of houses of clay, whose foundation is in the Dutch, which are 
and dust which are crushed before the moth. You got some pride in your life? Thinking you're something? The devil tries to get in my mind every single service. He's like, look at you up there, playing the piano. You're so good. Wow. <laughs> look how many came to the altar when you were playing. No. I said, that's not me, not I, but Christ. Right. Right. I will have a humble attitude God by God's grace. God how much longer? How much more? How much less have we settled for? We've settled for a mediocre Christianity. We're not even worthy to bear the name Christian because it pertains to the Lord. On the night when 39 were saved Friday night, God met with us that night. And I, I had to sit down and ask the Lord, I'm like, why would you meet with us? Lowly man. Because I knew that I, I hadn't been sold out. I hadn't been fully given over yet. God burdened this message on my heart, and He said, How much are you going to do for me? He gave His all, I'll give mine. But will you surrender it? The song says, All to Him I will freely give. That means nothing held back. Christ is reigning on the seat of your heart unchallenged. How much more? Is something hindering you tonight? How much? How much more? If I were you today, I would get my mind up. My foot's on the rock and my mind is made up. Every time the devil comes and tempts me, I said, no, not anymore. The season for sin is over. There's pleasure in sin for but a season, and that season is over, and I don't want it to come back. But knowing the devil, he's going to try as hard as he possibly can. He's going to bend over backwards to make sure that we can't get revived. We're thinking of the word revival as a noun instead of a verb. If we say our revival, we refer to it as just a meeting. We might as well say our meeting. Because we go to revival planning not to get revived. We need to change that from a noun to a verb. Our revival of our souls. In the verse just before, verse 28, it said, And Jacob's spirit revived. Because he'd heard that his son was alive and that he was doing great things for God. His spirit revived within himself. Are you going to get revived? Purpose it in your heart today, right now, that you will not wait any longer purpose in your heart that how much you're going to give is everything. How much you're going to take is nothing. How much you're going to serve is your all. Thank you. We're going to look in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10. Verse number 25 tells me some things. Tells me there's a certain lawyer. He stood up and he tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? So here we find that he's talking about eternal life. That's what we're going to talk about this week is eternal yeah. life. Hope you got some. Hey, I'm going to live forever. I don't know about you. Yeah. And verse 27 says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. I don't want to be half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest the way that, uh, that way... And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, 
when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, health and joy, <laughs> and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and he gave it to the host and said to him, Take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again. When I come again? Yeah. Yeah. I, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of thee, of these three, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showeth mercy on him. He couldn't even say Samaritan. No. Couldn't even say the word. No. And then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So here I want to talk about just three things. There was a plan. I'm glad God's got a plan. Amen. Listen, when this Samaritan, uh, I know this is a parable, and uh, but when uh, this uh Young man asked him, said, Lord, he was a he was a lawyer, and he stood up and he said, Lord, uh, and he tempted him, saying, Master, not Lord, he said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so here's what Jesus did. He gave him an, a question. That's what Jesus always did. He asked a question when when something was given to him. And what about the question? What are you going to do with eternal to uh, receive eternal life? There's only one way. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm truth. I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And uh, he said it's written in the law. And so he's a lawyer. He said, how readest thou the law? Now you say, what kind of lawyer? He was probably a Levite, by the way. And so this hurt him deeply when, when Jesus began to talk about uh, this uh, this parable. He said the parable. And... Uh, he said that, and he was willing to justify himself. So uh, here, here's the plan, but there was a person, and and not only a person, and by the way, Jesus loved this Levite. Yes. You say, how do you know that? Because God loved the world. Right. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Yes. I, I, I said this morning, I said there wouldn't be any problems if there wasn't no people. Right. You know why we say that? Because we know who we are. And I often think, would I, would I want to be my friend? <laughs> Only if I had some donuts. <laughs> and, and he said, and so uh, we see this person. And uh, then we, we hear a parable. And in this parable, he talks about, this is a story of ruin. Here's a, here's a man that fell among thieves. He, uh, and and he, he must have thought, boy, here, here comes a priest. I'm, I'm all right. Things are going to be okay. But this is a story of religion. He saw him on the other side. By the way, religion won't get you to heaven. Religion says do, do, do. I, and Jesus says done. I'm glad it's been done. I'm glad it's been accomplished. I'm grateful for that. Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. And, uh, and this is also a story of rejection. And uh, I, I wrote this down. I didn't. I didn't come up with this. But there's some philosophies here we find. He said, uh, first is the thief's philosophy. He said, what you have is mine. That's communism. That's socialism. I'm not political, but it doesn't take much to figure out what communists believe. They believe uh, everything's ours. I, and then the priest and the Levite. He said, what I have is mine. That's capitalism. I'm going to take it. It's mine. I, but then we have a, a Christian a philosophy which says, what I have belongs to you. And that, that's, what, uh, that's, what this, uh, that's what this Samaritan said. He said, if I can help you in any way, I'll do it. So we see uh, uh, the Samaritan's a type of Christ. That's amazing, isn't it? The one that, uh, G, that the Jews hated so much. Uh, Jesus loved them, by the way. What, whatever the world hates uh, probably is a good thing for you to love. 
I, I'm glad that the world ha has treated you bad. The world's treated me bad. The world's bad. Uh, but God's good. And he says everlasting. So so here's a question this lawyer asked. And he says, uh, a certain lawyer stood up and he tempted the Lord. So his desire was to destroy Jesus. Right. Uh, everything. Hey, why do you have eternal life? It's because the Lord loves you. Right. Saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I, and so uh, his question becomes this. It's probably one just like you have or have had. Uh, what must I do to, inter to uh, inherit eternal life? And so to inherit is something you don't really, you don't, you don't work for it. It's something that's given to you. I'm glad eternal life was given to me. Uh, I couldn't have, I couldn't have bought it. I don't have enough money. Uh, somebody, I, I was talking to a preacher not long ago, and he said, uh, I'm a better singer than you are. He, no, he said, I, I'm going to confess, you're a better singer than me. He said, but you ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I asked him the other day I said am I really ugly and he said no you're really not ugly uh, but really my sins are yeah. what must the Lord think when he looks on you right. am I a dead dog like wow. Woo. Wow. that's what Mephibosheth said wasn't it yeah. said am I just a dead dog right. don't look on me don't look at me Lord yeah. I'm just dirty and filthy uh, but I'm not because Christ cleaned me up. Hey, I'm cleaning him. Amen. Praise be to the Lord God. I have received Amen. eternal life. This lawyer had a question. And that question was, what's going to happen? That's, that's really what he's asking. What's going to happen? Uh, what's going to happen this week? You say, well, I may not be here. Uh, our preacher said it graciously. You can do what you want to do. If you want to come, you can come. If you don't want to come, just stay at home. We'll get revived. <laughs> We're getting in. Hey, I've come to get in. I ain't come to get out. And uh, that's my hope. That's my desire is to get in. That's my, that's, listen, that's what I've said. Lord, get me in. Lord, I, I want life and I want, to, I want it more abundant. That's what he said. He said, the truth will set you free. And, and, uh, and in, in Christ, we found freedom. Hey, this lawyer found out that uh, uh, he, I, I'm, I'm going to say he probably wished he'd never asked the Lord this. Yeah. Uh, never had asked, uh, but it was too late. Right. I mean, I'm glad some people asked some questions, aren't you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm glad old Thomas asked a question. Lord, we don't know the answer. Right. I, you know why? Because I don't know the answer, preacher. Right. Right. I don't know the answer, but I know, who, I know who's got them. Yeah. And so I think I'll just stay with God. Yeah. I think I'll just go with God. Yeah. Amen. God's a good God. And uh, we've heard some great preaching today. And God's helped me. i I'm, I'm been helped. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do for me the rest of the week. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.